Welcome to today's webinar, Preparing for 2023 ADAP Data Report or ADR Reporting, Updates and Best Practices. Thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Debbie Eisenberg. I'm a member of the DIST team, one of several groups engaged by HAB to provide training and technical assistance to AIDS drug assistance programs or ADAPs in completing the ADR. Today's webinar is going to be a joint presentation. First, you'll hear from Imogene Fua from Ryan White Data Support, also a group engaged by HAB to provide training and technical assistance. Imogene will focus on 2023 reporting clarifications and reminders and highlight some common reporting requirement challenges. Then I'll jump back in and discuss best practices for reporting high quality data. Today's webinar is specific, specifically focused on and for ADAPs, meaning a program at the state or territorial level that provides medication and or insurance services. ADAPs are responsible for completing and submitting the ADR annually. This webinar is also focused on reminders and best practices so we don't review all of the ADR requirements in detail. If you're new, we'll share some resources at the end of the webinar to review to help you get up to speed. Also be sure to sign up for the spring webinars. We'll, we'll be releasing that list in the next few weeks. Throughout the presentation, we will reference some resources that we think are important. To help you keep track of these and make sure you have access to them immediately, my colleague Isia, there it is in the chat, is going to chat out the link to a document right now that includes the locations of all the resources mentioned in today's webinar. Also, at any time, you'll be able to send us a question using the question function, which should be on the settings at the bottom of your screen. And you'll also be able to ask questions live at the end of the presentation, and I'll share instructions when we uh, get to that point. Now, before we start, I'm going to answer one of the most commonly asked questions about the slides. The recording for today's webinar will be available on Target HIV within one week of the webinar, and the slides and written Q&A or question and answer are usually available within two weeks. Today's webinar is supported by the organizations shown on the slide, and the contents are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of, nor an endorsement by, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. And now I'd like to turn things over to Imogene. So Imogene, take it away. Thanks, Debbie. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, this webinar, as Debbie said, is geared to help you prepare for the 2023 ADR submission. It's also a bit advanced. So if you're new to the ADR, there will be webinars that... Um, Debbie already mentioned in February and March that we'll have more information for beginner for beginners. Um, you can also go on to the um, Target um, HIV um, website where they have past webinars as well as videos for beginners. Um, but please do come back to this webinar for tips on some common challenges that we're gonna that we're seeing um, that most ADAPs are experiencing. So this is our um, overview for today. We'll, we'll begin with a submission timeline, um, then we'll dive right in. We're, we'll focus on the data elements um, in the client report that seem to be um, most challenging and also add some clarifications and tips. Then as Debbie said, she'll come back in and go over best practices. Um, she'll highlight the ADR webinars and the technical assistance resources that's available to you. So please do use it, reach out to us. And then as um, always, we'll have time at the end of the webinar for questions. We're also gonna have some polls throughout the webinar. So um, they do help us get to know you a little more, what's happening um, in your ADAP and also to help us tailor our TA um, to your needs. So let's start with the next poll for the first poll, Isia. Yep. All right, so before we get started, we'd like to learn more about your experience completing and submitting the ADR. 
Um, so which of the following best describes your ADR experience? And the options here are, I've submitted the ADR before, I've submitted the ADR once before, I've submitted the ADR multiple times. And correction on my first readout is I've never submitted the ADR before, not twice that you've submitted. All right, so we have over 60% of folks who chimed in with a response. So I'm just gonna give it a few more moments. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I'm sharing out those results. All right, Imogen, so 29% um, indicated that they've never submitted the ADR before, so about a third. Um, another, about a third said they've submitted the ADR once before, and then 43% indicated I've submitted the ADR multiple times. Great, so we do have um, some new ones. That's perfect. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can get this slide to go. Okay, here we go, sorry. Having slide issues here. So. Wonderful. So about <clears throat> half of you are new or 30%. Uh, so great. So don't hesitate, as I said, to reach out to us for any help. And then for those of you who are more experienced, um, hopefully some of the things that we'll discuss today will, will clarify some of your challenges that you may be experiencing. So this is the um, the ADR instruction manual for this year. Um, it's should be available on the Target HIV website the beginning of next year. So it's not yet available today. Um, it is an essential resource um, for you to use while completing your ADR. And it, it does provide more information on what we'll be um, talking about today. Okay, so this is the ADR submission timeline for this year. Um, beginning with the Check Your XML Tool opening date um, that's not yet set, please do keep a lookout for an update um, for when it will open, um, possibly January or February. The, the Check Your XML is a great tool. It's an important tool for, for you to start checking your data quality before the ADR um, system actually opens. So in January or February, you'll be able to test your client level data files um, to make sure that they comply with the ADR um, XML schema. And then on Monday, April 3rd, 2024, that's when the ADR system will officially open. So all of you can begin working on the recipient report and uploading your client level data. And then on Monday, April 24th, 2020, uh, 22nd, um, 2024 is the target upload date for client level data's, uh, data files. So we do recommend um, that you upload your data um, so that you have enough time to review and update any, any data before the final submission deadline, which is on um, Monday, June 3rd, 2024 at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So by this date, all ADRs um, should be in submitted status. So the good news is that for this year's submission, there are no changes to the data elements or reporting requirements. Um, there will be updates to the upload completeness report and the validations, which are both important tools that you can access in the ADR system to help you uh, quality check your data. Um, the upload completeness report allows you to check your data to make sure it accurately reflects your program, while the validation validations check to make sure your data are complete and correct against the ADR system requirements. So these updates are anticipated to come out in January. Okay, so let's move right on along. Um, in the next few slides, as I said, I'm going to go at and highlight a few reporting clarifications and reminders that tend to be common reporting challenges. So the first thing I want to go over is health insurance coverage. Um, we found that there is some confusion, particularly with how to report certain ones, so we'll go over them. There, these are a few things that we um, wanted you to consider. So we've noticed that ADAPs are actually reporting clients in other plan. Um, and as, as we asked more about this, as we asked you about this, we identified that in some cases, um, you're actually reporting other plan. Um, it's 
I'm sorry. We we found that in some cases, other plan is being used to report clients that who are receiving insurance for which the ADAP is paying the premium. So just because ADAP is paying doesn't mean it goes in other plan. Those clients should be reported as private insurance individual or private insurance employer, depending um, upon the type of premium that's being paid. There's also some confusion about what to report if the client has health coverage that is limited coverage. So like for example, medic limited Medicaid plans. You want to report the health coverage regardless of what the plan covers. So for limited um, Medicaid plan, go ahead and report Medicaid. And then finally, uh, Medicare Part C was added as a health coverage option for the 2021 ADR, but we've noticed that some ADAPs are not reporting any clients with Medicare um, Part C coverage. So we just wanted to remind everyone to um, be sure that those options are included in your application and recertification forms and that they should be reported in your ADR. Um, so let's see, um, let's do another poll to make sure that you understood my explanations, that I was clear. So Isi, if you could launch the next poll, that would be great. Thanks, Hi, Mickey. Um, So I launched that second poll. And so for this one, which of the following options would be reported as other plan for health coverage? And you can select multiple um, options for this one. So the options are an ADAP paying the subsidized premium of a marketplace plan, an ADAP paying the employee portion of an employer-sponsored plan, a Medicaid plan that has limited coverage, a company that self-insures and pays the medical expenses of the employees, Medicare Advantage plans, or none of the above. And since this was a bit of a, a quiz with the response options were a little lengthy, I'm gonna give folks a few more moments to respond. Let you think through what the options might be. All right, just a few more moments. I'm closing out the poll now. All right, I'm Jane. So we had responses um, were selected for each of the choices that were listed. So we had 19% um, for the first option, another 19% for the second option, 15% saying a Medicaid plan that had limited coverage, 48% um, almost half chose a company that self-insures and pays the medical expenses of the employees. Another 15% said Medicare Advantage plans, and then 33% said none of the above. Okay, so let's go over the quest, the answers. Sorry, I'm having issues. Okay, here we go. All right, so these are um, the answers to the poll that you just completed. So you were asked which of the scenarios on the left should be reported as other plan. So the first scenario is when ADAP is paying the subsidized premium of a marketplace plan. This would be private individual, not other plan. So a marketplace plan is private insurance. Just because it's being paid by ADAP doesn't make it other plan. The second scenario is when ADAP is paying the employee portion of an employer sponsored plan. This is private employer, not other plan. It's private insurance that the employer is sponsored even if ADAP pay the employee portion. Again, just because it's paid by ADAP does not make it other plan. And then a Medicaid plan that has limited coverage as we talked about in the other slide, this falls under Medicaid, not other plan. Even though it's limited, it's still considered Medicaid. And then a company that self-insures and pays the medical experience expenses of the employees, this is the ADR manual definition of other plan. It's, it's not a common scenario and the scenario doesn't fit into the other categories. So this is reported as other plan. And then Medicare Advantage plan, that's, actually considered Medicare Part C. It's just another name that's used sometimes for Medicare Part C. So it's also should not be reported as other plan, but reported as Medicare Part C. Okay, 
So let's tackle um, the ADAP application questions, um, application received and application approved dates. So first of all, these dates are only reported for new clients. So application received date is the first date that your ADAP received a completed application. And it can also be prior to the reporting period. Um, while an application approved date is the date that you approved the first completed application, and that must be within the reporting period. The common reporting um, issue that we notice is that for the application received date, um, ADAPS um, report dates as old as up to two years old, um, which may reflect that a client submitted a partially completed application. So let's um, go through an example um, to further illustrate this to you. Okay, so starting off, um, let's look at these two, two new clients, starting off with client A, uh, who submitted a completed application to your ADAP on December 29th, 2022. And then the application was approved January 5th, 2023. So in this situation, December 29th, 2022 would be reported as the application received date. And then January 5th, 2023 would be reported as the application approved date. So kind of straightforward there. But let's look at client B. So client B submitted a partially completed application on December 7th, 2021, which is about two years ago, but was never completed. Now, a month ago on September 23rd, 2023, that same client, client B, submitted a completed application. So, and then this one was approved on October 19th, 2023. So in this case, September 23rd, 2023 would be reported as the application received date because that's when it was completed. And then October 19th, 2023 would be reported as the application approved date. Um, also, I want to point out that the incomplete application received in 2022 would not be reported in the ADR. Okay, so now let's go over the next data element, the um, disenrollment question, which asks why your ADAP client was disenrolled. And you're given several categories. Again, here we notice that other has been used fairly often. It's, it's fine to use other if the existing categories don't fit, but it's important to first map other to the existing categories um, if possible. So for example, if a client moved out of state or the client's income increased above your ADAPS requirements, those can actually be mapped to the category client's eligibility changed, client no longer meets eligibility criteria. So please do see, make sure um, if the disenrollment reason can be mapped to existing categories first before choosing other. So the DIS team can help you develop a crosswalk if you need some help getting started on this. So get in touch with them um, and so they can help you out. So one more reminder on reporting health insurance assistance services. We love this topic. We are still seeing some ADAPs reporting premium payments incorrectly. Remember, a full premium payment is when ADAP pays 100% of the premium for purchasing a client's health insurance. And then a partial premium is when the ADAP pays for a portion of the premium. Now you'll notice here that I said premium and premium is underlined on the slide. So to go further into that, when you get the bill, and your ADAP pays the entire bill, um, you'll need to check whether you are paying the full premium or a subsidized premium payment. So once you verify whether your ADAP paid for a full premium or a partial premium payment, payment that's what you report. Full premium payment for 100% of the premium or partial payment for a subsidized premium. Um, 
linked on this slide is this ADR and focus document um, that further explains um, partial premiums, which should be also should, which should be helpful. So um, you say, let's do another poll to see if I've clarified things. All right, so I'm launching this third poll. Um, so your ADAP pays premiums for clients. Which of the following would be reported as partial premiums? And for this, you can also select multiple. Um, so the first option is that the client has a marketplace plan and gets a subsidy. Um, the client has a marketplace plan and does not get a subsidy. The client has Medicare Part D. The client has Medicare Part D low income subsidy or LIS. The client has an employer sponsored plan or none of the other. And just like the last quiz, I'm going to give folks a little bit more time to respond to this. Okay, just a few more moments. Go ahead and close this out now. All right, Amy Jean, so 76% chose client as a marketplace plan and gets a subsidy. Um, one person, 3% chose the client has a marketplace plan and does not get a subsidy. Uh, no one chose client has Medicare Part D. Um, we had 55% indicating the client has Medicare Part D, low income subsidy. 24% um, for a client has an employer sponsored plan. And then two people, 7% chose none of the above. So responses are kind of mixed. Up with this. Great. Good job. Um, let me, I'm going to go over the, the answers. Okay. So again, as I explained, hopefully explained in the other slide. The main takeaway here is that it isn't about whether ADAP paid the entire bill. You have to know the type of plan the client has. So let's go through the answers. So for example, the first example is that the client has a marketplace plan and gets the subsidy. So you should report this as a partial premium because the payment ADAP paid is subsidized. So now the second example is that the client does not get a subsidy so that it's a full premium payment. And then Medicare Part D, which I think most of you, all of you got right, is a full premium because there is no subsidy. But for Medicare Part D low income subsidy, that payment is subsidized so that it would be a partial payment. And then lastly, if the client has an employer sponsored plan, it would also be a partial payment because the employer paid a portion of it. Okay, so let's go to another common challenge that we noticed, um, which is in reporting medication payments, um, specifically distinguishing between full pain full pay medication and medication co-pays or co-insurance and deductibles. So full payment of medications is reported under the medication services, which means that ADAP paid for that medication in full. But when the ADAP pays for a co-pay or a co-insurance or, or deductible for medication, it goes under health insurance assistance services because the health insurance is the main service that paid for that medication. Um, we also know that this can be um, more difficult for ADAPs to determine um, because uh, if they receive a, a claim file from their, their PBM, for example, um, usually it doesn't distinguish those costs. So, um, we do suggest that if um, you you do have if you do receive it that way to ask your PBM to actually provide you with two files that distinguishes those two different types of costs. So medications paid in full or another file that has medication copay um, insurance and deductibles. Okay. The next common reporting challenge that I want to go over um, requires some background. So I want to go take a moment to go over two terms um, before moving on. So let's review um, the first term, which is reimbursements. Um, reimbursements occur when a payer pays um, the ADAP back for a service. So here um, I'm going to go through over through an example. So first, the ADAP application. Um, is approved. Um, 
but it's also determined that they should apply for Medicaid. So the client is enrolled in the ADAPS full medication, uh, full pay medication program and receives their medication. But then a month later, after being enrolled in the ADAP, the client is approved for Medicaid. Um, Medicaid um, will not only pay for the client's medications moving forward, but can, uh, but can also be billed for the medications already provided to the client. So this is known as Medicaid backbilling. Um, the ADAP bills um, Medicaid for past medications paid, and then the ADAP gets reimbursed. Okay, so the next term that I want to go over is reversals. Reversals. Reversals occur, occur when a cost is paid by an ADAP that is later refunded. So a common example is that a medication is dispensed but the client doesn't pick it up or the premium is, is, is paid by the client who was disenrolled before the effective period. So let's walk through another example. A client is enrolled in the ADAPS full um, pay medication program. The pharmacy prepares a client's medication for pickup. And then the pharmacy submits a claim for the dispensed medication, assuming that it will get picked up. However, after a week, the client actually doesn't pick up the medication. Um, since that the client never received the medication, the ADAP doesn't have to pay for the medication, and so the claim is reversed. Okay, so now that we've gone over reimbursement and reversals, let's go over what they have to do with reporting medication services in the ADR. So first, um, ADAP should only report medication services for which there is a cost to the ADAP. So if a service was reimbursed, the original cost of the service should be reported, but not the reimbursement. You do not need to go back um, and fix the service. Um, however, if the cost for the service was reversed, ADAP should not report that service at all um, since it was never received. So that means that the ADAP needs to go back and reconcile their, their, their data. Um, we've also noticed um, that ADAPs are submitting services with um, zero cost. And when we asked, um, we learned that this may be medications that cost less than a dollar, but more than 50 cents. Um, in those cases, please be sure to round up to a dollar uh, for the purposes of of reporting in the ADR. And then also a reminder that medication costs should be reported before rebates and should not include dispensing fees. And the final reminder that we have has to do with viral loads. So for viral load counts, you should report these counts as copies per millimeter and not the log scale. Sometimes you get test results um, and they only give you the log scale, and then sometimes they will give you both. So if you're only given the log scale, um, you will need to convert it to copies per milliliters. Um, so for example, here on this slide, if you have a log result of 1.3, that should be converted um, and reported as 20 copies per milliliter. Um, if you do need help in converting, please reach out to the DIST team. Uh, okay, so this is actually, this ends uh, my part of the presentation. Um, thank you all. Um, you did a great job on the polls. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Debbie now. Great. So, thanks so much, Imogene. Lots of great content. So I'm going to um, talk about uh, four best practices that we've identified that can make the ADR submission both easier and your data more complete and accurate, which is the goal of the, of the webinar, is to make sure the important work that you're doing is reflected in your data. First is gathering available technical assistance resources and tools so you have them readily available. Next is documenting your ADR process. It's very important, particularly developing a programmatic crosswalk between your local ADAP activities and the ADR reporting requirements. And I'm gonna be talking about all of these in a little more detail in a moment. 
Next, reviewing your data throughout the year. You've hear, heard this frequently from us and not just before the ADR submission. And last, but definitely not least, establishing data sharing with your HIV surveillance program. So uh, as I said, I'm gonna review each of these in a little more detail. Okay, so let's start with gathering your tools. So there are a lot of resources on Target HIV. If you're not familiar with Target HIV, it is the one-stop shop or resources for Ryan White recipients and providers and ADAPs on a range of topics, including data and reporting. And there's actually a page specific to the ADR, which is one of the links that you receive. Um, we suggest folks just go ahead and bookmark that. And that's a great starting point uh, to help you with ADR related resources. I also wanna highlight some specific resources we recommend. The first one is the one you already heard about from Imogene, the ADR instruction manual. It is updated each year to reflect any reporting requirement changes, which there are not this year, as well as clarifications on existing requirements. And, and we base the clarifications on questions that we receive from you, as well as reviewing the data that's submitted. So um, a lot of what you heard today, you'll see in the updated manual. You'll also always want to check the ADR validations. And these are the validation messages that are programmed into the ADR web system to help support the submission of high quality data. And changes can include the addition of new validations, the removal of existing ones, and the escalation of a validation. And that is there's three types of validations, alerts, warnings, and errors. And uh, the lowest is an alert, which is informational. And the highest is an error, which prevents your submission. So the type of validation message can change as well. So these haven't been updated yet. We anticipate that to be early next year. And we'll also be talking about validations more in the spring ADR webinar series. You'll also wanna be sure that you have the right version of your system that you use to create your ADR client level data file. So if you're using an ADR ready system, which means a system that produces the client level data file that's required, um, the DIS team actually updates the status on target HIV. So we list the build or the version number that you need to use. So you can be sure to check that. Um, if you're a Trax user, once you open Trax, and that is a free application from the HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau that creates, again, a client level data file. Once you open it, it's automatically updated. It's the way it works. And Trax uses CSV files, which are basically un unformatted Excel files. Um, if there's not a reporting change, those files stay the same, so you can use them. If there is a reporting change, when you download the tracks package, you get the updated CSV files. Also, be sure to register for the ADR webinars, and I'm going to talk more about future webinars um, later in the presentation. Also, remember, all webinars are recorded, so if for some reason you can't attend the webinar live, you can always watch the recording. The DIS listserv, and uh, we'd say choose the ADR option. It's another resource. You'll receive important updates regarding the ADR submission. I do wanna tell you not to worry though. We don't send a lot of emails out through that intentionally. So those are important updates. You just go to that link. It'll ask you which of the reports you wanna receive updates for and you just check off ADR and submit it. And finally, and probably most importantly is be sure to ask for help. Um, it's really important to ask for help early um, asking for help will always be there, but it's much harder to fix issues in April and May than to fix an issue in November, December, or even January. I'm going to share more about technical systems that is available. I'm going to go through the resources, but also we have a very handy brochure um, that lists all the providers. I don't believe the dates, uh, the timelines updated on the brochure yet, but the providers are the same providers. Um, it's a great resource to have. You can tape it up by your desk and you have it ready to go. All right, so now if you've ever joined a, a technical assistance webinar or received technical assistance from us, you've heard us talk about documenting. So what do we actually mean? Well, the first and foremost, you need to be able to be sure that your ADAP can speak Ryan White. And what do I mean by that? For most ADAPs, what the program is called locally is different than the terms used in the ADR. And let me, I'm gonna walk through a quick example. So here's, a, here's an ADAP, and I'm using the federal term. So the AIDS Drug Assistance Program is everything that, a, that is done within a ADAP. 
they actually though in this this local program they have two individual programs they call one aid app which is just what they call their full pay medication program and they have another program they call their health insurance program or hip and this program includes insurance premium assistance for private health insurance plans as well as medication and office visit co-pays and the office visit co-pays are paid for by ryan white part b not adap and those are for clients for whom they are paying their, their full or partial insurance premium. For each program, the vendor agency is listed so they know the data source. Also in what federal report it must be reported and the associated service category. So you can see that for this ADAP, they would actually report activities in both the ADR and the RSR. By developing the crosswalk, it not only facilitates accurate data reporting, but also helps staff understand federal terminology as compared to state or territorial terminology. In addition, it can highlight potential data quality issues. And let me give you an example. For this ADAP, so this is based on a real example, when a client moved from their ADAP to their HIP, so they went from a full pay program to their insurance assistance program, the staff were actually updating the enrollment status to disenrolled in the data system and then adding a new application received and application approved date to reflect enrollment in the insurance program or enrollment in HIP. And this also meant that the client was reported as new after previously being reported as existing, they were reported as new in the ADR. While the ADAP considers this two programs, so the federal, the term I'm using ADAP is a federal term. They feel they have, they have two programs, they call one ADAP and they call one HIP. For the purposes of the ADR, they have one program one program, one enrollment. And before this crosswalk was complete, they didn't really realize they were reporting incorrectly. So this is something we're happy to do. We, we I've actually done four, I think already this year. Um, we're happy to meet with, with you um, and go through this with you. It's a little different for every program we work with. We have found it's really essential to identify possible reporting issues. All right. so. You also want to highlight key program deadlines. HAB lists the federal deadlines. Those are the ones in the timeline that Imogene highlighted, but it doesn't list anywhere when you're going to start working on the ADR. When will you request data from your pharmacy benefit manager or PBM, your insurance benefit manager, HIV surveillance, any place you get data from? When will the teams working on the ADR meet? When will you review data? So none of those are in the national timeline. You have to establish those yourself. It's also important to know who's doing what. Programmatic fiscal and data or and IT staff all have a role in completing the ADR in terms of information that's requested. We actually have developed a resource called ADR Roles and Responsibilities. Yes, that is it on the screenshot on the slide. And no, I don't expect you to be able to read that, which is why we included the link in the resources that ECS sent out. It's very useful in outlining the roles and responsibilities for the key ADR activities. And finally, outlining data sources. Um, in the previous slide, I listed the vendor from which the ADAP receives their data. It's important to ensure that that vendor is both collecting the needed data and provides it in a format and within a timeline that supports the ADR submission. And finally, the data sources you use will need to be mapped to the system that you use for the ADR. And what we mean by that is usually how data is collected in one system may not align with how it has to be reported for the ADR. And you can use the ADR data crosswalk. We also included that in the resources to help document this. And the DISC team can also help you assist you with that if that would be helpful. Okay, on to data review. What we most commonly see is that ADAPs wait to review their data until it is in their ADR ready system or tracks. And most ADAPs um, have other systems they're using routinely during the year. The challenge is that if you have a data quality issue, it's pretty difficult to resolve it if you find out about it in April or May. So we recommend reviewing data throughout the year to both identify and correct any data quality issues. But we understand that based on how many of you operate your programs, it may not be feasible to combine all of your data multiple times a year. Let's look at the earlier example I shared. Let's say the ADAP had, a, had that full pay medication program, they called it ADAP. Again, I know it's confusing. That's why we want you to develop the crosswalk, right? Federally, it's called ADAP, but they actually called just their full pay medication program locally ADAP. And then they had HIP. 
So two programs under that larger ADAP umbrella. The ADAP may be able to review data for each program individually, but not across programs for the ADR until closer to the submission. The ADAP might also review data by data source, looking at enrollment data, claims data, premium data, and clinical data. That's another way to look to see if it looks right. And that is definitely still helpful. But that means you have to know what to look for regarding incorrect data. That's why we suggest using the structure of the ADR to check your data. Putting your data into the ADR structure provides additional context that can highlight data quality issues that may not have been evident from the individual review that I just referenced. We suggest at a minimum to try to do a mid-year review using the ADR structure. When I say ADR structure, I mean bringing all the files together to meet the requirements of the, of the ADR. And that may mean combining files for tracks and, or making sure all of the data that you use is entered or imported into Careware or any other system that you might use. And remember, I want to clarify, we talked about Check Your XML opening. It's actually always available. What changes each year are any schema, which means the structure of the file, validation or upload completeness report updates. So every year the system is updated because it's a new reporting year, so the dates have to be updated. Sometimes there's changes in validations and the upload completeness report, as IMG mentioned. And if the reporting requirements change, that's when the schema changes. So we announce those once it's implemented, meaning when does it open? That means all the changes for the 2023 ADR will be implemented. But it's still open today. You can go today and upload a file. It will just reference 2022 dates. For Careware users, the viewer and the validation reports are built into Careware and are great resources. I've included links here that provide more information about the reports is a great way if you are routinely uh, importing or entering data in Careware, it makes it a little easier to review it throughout the year. Finally, let's talk about data sharing. All CD4 and all viral load data have to be reported for all clients, regardless of whether or not they receive services. And that was a change in the 2021 ADR. So this continues to be challenging for some ADAPs, particularly those who rely on application and recertification processes to get labs. And with changes to processes as a result of policy clarification notice 2102, it may get even more difficult to get labs. So what's the solution? Working with your HIV surveillance program to share data in both directions. HIV surveillance gets labs for all people with HIV, so that includes ADAP clients. And this is actually something the data sharing encouraged by not only HAB, but CDC. We know that this takes a lot of time and resource, and we're happy to help you with technical assistance. And we have two documents on target HIV that are on the right-hand side of the screen that outline more about data sharing, and then just let us know if you'd like our help with the process. So I have a poll as well. It is not a knowledge check though. I'm gonna ask Isia to go ahead and launch the poll. We're just checking on how you're doing. Right. So for this final poll, um, based on today's webinar, which of the following statements best fits your needs for technical assistance? Um, so I'm good to go, but thanks for the offer. I need to check, but I'll reach out if needed. I definitely need help, so please contact me or I'm new to the ADR, please help. And if you're not sure if you need any help, you can also, you can put that in the Q&A. It's not listed as a response option, but feel free to indicate that to us in the Q&A. I'm gonna give folks a few more moments. Go ahead and end the poll now. Hi, Debbie. 38% indicated I'm good to go, but thanks for the offer. Um, a little over half said I need to check, but I'll reach out if needed. We had uh, one person saying they definitely need help, so please contact me. And then two people indicating I'm new to the ADR, please help. All right. So um, we will definitely, the folks who said please help, we will reach out to you. Um, everyone else who said they might need help, um, if you're not sure, um, let us know. Otherwise, if you ask for help, we'll reach out to you. So let's go ahead and wrap up. We're gonna talk about some upcoming ADR webinars. Um, so first is just a reminder that today is the start of the ADR season. 
We do have an upcoming webinar in December. It's focused on strategies for ADR data integration. Um, that's because most ADAPs have multiple data sources they use for the ADR, and we're going to discuss approaches to make combining those sources uh, easier. We'll also have those webinars in the spring of 2024. We'll definitely be sending out a schedule for that. It'll be on Target HIV, but also go ahead and sign up for the DIS listserv, and we'll notify you when it's available. And um, you can also check the data webinar calendar. That is where all of the webinars that the DISC and data support teams um, are doing together. We also do annual um, ADR outreach to help you look at your data more closely. This year, we did do some summer outreach. If there was something we noticed that looked like it was a data workflow issue um, for the ADAP, and we wanted them to be aware earlier. Um, We'll send out that state summary report folks are used to that provides the aggregate ADR data and schedule calls to follow up, as well as provide technical assistance. If you want to start technical assistance earlier, you just need to contact us. Otherwise, it'll be when we reach out to you, which is probably going to be early uh, December. For new folks, I'm gonna we have a resource we're going to share with you. Um, I want to highlight this, particularly for those folks who are new. There's three short videos, introduction to the ADR, creating the ADR client level data file, and tips for ADR data quality. So it's a great place to start if you are new, and then we'll also reach out to you and make sure that you get the support you need for the upcoming submission. And finally, moving on to um, the resources. I know that was a lot of information. Some of you, particularly if you're new, may be feeling overwhelmed. Um, there are several resources available. The DISC team, which I'm a member of, we focus on uh, technical questions, also folks needing uh, a significant amount of assistance, data quality, and we also help on tracks. Ryan White Data Support addresses ADR-related content and submission questions. This is things like uh, how to interpret the instruction manual, um, validation questions, or questions around allowable responses for data elements. EHB Customer Support Center is everything related to the electronic handbook. So registration, permissions, and um, performance report submission statuses. And finally, the CareWare Help Desk, if you're a CareWare user, is really the best resource. And we do encourage you to join the listserv. Um, it is a place where all the CareWare users across the country will post. It's a great resource. The take-home message is there is no wrong door. So reach out to one of us. And if we can't help you, we'll make sure to connect you to the right technical assistance provider. So we wanna thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to move over to um, a quick reference to finding out more about HRSA, hrsa.gov, and move to the question and answer portion of our webinar.